Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and author of the best-selling biblical thriller, The Codis, now out in second edition. Get your copy on Amazon Kindle, just $2.99. And my latest book, just released in Indonesia, uh, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. Now go to our website, ignitingandnation.com. Click on the special offers. You're going to find a cover of this book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, I want you to click on it. Now, you're going to get a little window that's going to ask for your email address. We won't send you spam because spam is not kosher, but we will send you the first chapter of this book. I want to welcome you into a very special two-hour edition of the Carl Gallup's Hour with my guest, Dr. Carl, I'm sorry, Carl Gallup's and Zev Perot from Israel. Carl Gallup's is the author of Gods and Thrones, Nahash, Forgotten Prophecy, and the Return of the Elohim, when the Lion Roars, Understand the Implications of Ancient Prophecy for Our Time, and many other books. Carl's a senior pastor of Hickory Hammock Baptist Church in Milton, Florida since 1987. An Amazon Top 60 best-selling author and a conservative talk radio host heard nationally and internationally for the last 16 years. He's also a prolific TV, radio, and print media commentator, a former decorated Florida law enforcement officer. He's the founder of the Internet, PNN News and Ministry Network, www.ppsimmons.com, and a member of the Board of Regents at the University of Mobile in Mobile, Alabama. He can be seen here on Revealing the Truth on the United Nation Broadcasting Network on the second Monday of every month at 12 o'clock p.m. for the Carl Gallup's Hour. I also want to welcome my dear brother from Tel Aviv, Zev Parat, Rabbi Zev Parat, born in Israel, raised in the Orthodox Jewish city of B'nai Barak. He was raised an Orthodox Jew in a rabbinic family. His father, grandfather, and ancestors were all rabbis. Zeb was born again in Yeshua after many years of hearing the gospel on the internet and reading the prophecies of the Old Testament. The minute he received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, he began to share the gospel of Yeshua everywhere. He says, now we go out on the streets as the Spirit of God guides us. Zeb understands that being a completed Jew is believing in Yeshua. This comes at a personal cost that he and his wife, Lynn, are willing to pay for the salvation of Israel. Being a native-born evangelist, he has been persecuted and most of his family has disowned him. Zev says, Yeshua called me to share the gospel with the lost sheep of Israel because as the Lord says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. No matter what the persecution danger, I will continue to share the gospel until all of Israel will be saved. Carl Gallops. Welcome to the program. Rabbi Eric, thanks. It's a great honor to be back with you. What Wonderful a, to have you here in is. studio. And Rabbi Zev Parat, my Thank brother, you. last time I saw you was in uh, the Galilee. We had a lovely dinner together. We actually closed the restaurant. <clears throat> we had no shortage of things to talk about. We talked from 7 o'clock until all of a sudden the lights around us were being turned out. The staff was gone. There we were sitting. Uh, we barely ate. You but do know when they turned out the lights, they were trying to tell you to leave. You knew that, right? Well, when, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, yes. we, 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 we actually didn't care. It was because you had to drive back to Tel Aviv. Otherwise, we could have talked all night. We could have, yeah, went all night. We actually <laughs> continued to talk near the car also later. It's, it? it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, it, you know, uh, there's a Hebrew or Yiddish concept called besheret, something that was meant to be by God. And this friendship that I have with the two of you, is really in a God-ordained encounter that a Baptist minister from uh, Milton, Florida, a uh, Messianic rabbi from Tel Aviv, and an ordained Messianic rabbi and ordained Baptist minister. Yeah. Okay, both, I carry both ordinations that opens the door. It's a key that God has given me to open up doors to all kinds of people. Would be here together for this very special edition, celebrating the 70th anniversary of, of, of uh, the reunification of, of, of Jerusalem, the birth, the birth of Israel, the uh, 51st year of the uh, 67 war, uh, so many monumental milestone events, uh, breakthrough in your life in the last five years, breakthrough in my life in the last five years. God is doing something new. Zev, your journey to faith culminated with being exposed to the gospel, but I have to say that the, the gospel itself never really pierced my heart. Uh, I looked at 2,000 years of history as to what was done in the name of Christ, and I grew mm -hmm. up in a Catholic city where I was called a Christ killer. Mm -hmm. 
So the message of the gospel wasn't what pierced my heart. All right? It was the story of the Lamb of God on Mount Moriah, the Lamb of God mm -hmm. in Exodus chapter 12, and the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the earth. You heard the gospel message, but it was augmented by your study of the prophecies. How did that story evolve in your life, and when did the lights... It, it wasn't, was it somebody leading you to the Lord, or was this through discovery and through a true encounter with the Holy Spirit? I actually left uh, Rabbi Walker being an Orthodox Jew and went drifted into being uh, what you call a traditional Jew after not finding the God of Abraham, Isaacs, and Jacob, not in the relationship aspect because growing up as a religious Jew. And one day on the Internet when I was trying to run away from God, is when somebody found me and started to witness to me for four years almost on a daily basis and I was reading the Messianic prophecies and rejecting them because thinking these, these Messianic prophecies have nothing to do with me they have to do everything with the Gentiles I'm you know I'm a student of the Talmud I studied the Gemara my whole life and if anything Isaiah 53 was told for me not to read it was the forbidden chapter and even if we did read it, it was speaking about Israel. And then suddenly, as I'm reading this and listening to this guy on the Internet, the Holy Spirit just started. I didn't know it was the Holy Spirit yet, but it was working behind the scenes. And I began to see that he was led like a lamb to slaughter. He did not open his mouth. It seems to me like that Christian Jesus. How could it be? It's in the, it's in the Jewish Bible. And then what happened was, there's always a spirit of rejection and everything. You, you're seeing it, but you're not believing it. And I did a, uh, what, what I call an investigation in Israel. On a period of two years, I interviewed 32 rabbis in Israel and my grandfather, which was one of the head of the Sanhedrins. I received 26 different answers to the same question. We say three Jews in a room, two opinions. Well, 26 different opinions <laughs> for one Bible verse in Israel. The Bible verse, of course, was Micha, Micah. Chapter 5, verses 2 to 4, where it speaks about a birth of a king, Bebet Lechem, Bethlehem, house of bread, which we all know which is Messiah Yeshua. But what really, really got me to a situation where I started to believe that Yeshua is the Messiah was in Micah 5, 2 in Hebrew, in many translations, it says, Yamav me kedem yamav, which translates, his days are before the foundation of the world. Only God is before the foundation of the world. And right there is really when I started to have visions at night, walk around, and uh, one day after four years, after finally meeting the main rabbi of Israel, uh, Rabbi Israel Lau, Rabbi Israel Lau. Today his son, uh, David, David Lau, was the main rabbi of Israel. And he actually bar mitzvahed me, so it was very easy for me to get a, an appointment with him. When I walked into Rabbi Lau's office, and he told me, Zev, Zev Isedir, it's okay. Yeshivim panim la Torah. There's 70 faces to the Bible. Mm -hmm. I knew right there that Yeshua was the Messiah. But I knew it in my mind. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it in my heart. And we know that Jeremiah 31 says that God will write the Torah, will write the, the Word of God on our heart. It's a, it's a heart issue. The heart must change. Yes. The mind is not, it's not a knowledge issue. It's a spiritual issue. And two nights later I had that supernatural encounter. What did it was Isaiah 53, Yeshayahu Nun Gimel. And God called my, my name two times from a shiny cloud. Looking back now, I believe it was the cloud that was hovering over the, over the Jews when they were freed from bondage. And he called my name. He said, Zev, Zev, Yeshayahu Nun Gimel. Zev Mashiach Shel Yisrael. And right there I was born again. I just, it was the first time, Eric, that I felt the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was the first time that that pride that I had growing up in a, in a rabbinic family, that I had some kind of a, a special advantage, it was right there that I understood that by His grace and His love, and because, we speak about the foundation of the world, because He wrote me in the Lamb's Book of Life yes. before yes. the foundation yes. of the world, was I, was I saved. And right there, it was just being on fire for the Lord and preaching the gospel everywhere and they say a new believer is on fire I'm an old believer and I'm still on fire <laughs> uh, we pray that fire never dies down and and it's, it's just exciting so the messianic prophecies are powerful if they're proclaimed in context in the original Jewish way they're supposed to be uh, proclaimed and not in the pagan way 
you know, so interesting that uh, <clears throat> God would connect the two of you. Yeah. Uh, pastor Carl being a well-respected pastor, long-term. Uh, pastor Carl has been a, uh, an inspiration to so many to unravel the prophecies. And like my growing up with my rabbi, uh, I have had uh, almost a uh, uh, rabbinical relationship with Carl in my dialogue. We don't have to agree. We have to love. That's right. We don't have to say this or that. We can say, I'm leaning this way based on this evidence. And I say, I'm leaning this way based on this evidence. But you have always been so gracious. And I know you've extended that same grace to uh, Rabbi Zev because I've seen the chemistry. And we share a common, as if, uh, the, se the same bloodline, the bloodline of Moshiach, the Amen. bloodline of the Messiah who has connected us. Your friend that was witnessing to you is fulfilling Romans chapter 11. Yes. There is a call. I, I, I've heard all I want to hear about us being the chosen people. And, <laughs> and, and uh, my goodness, maybe God could choose somebody else for a change with all the tourists and trouble that we as a people have had. But we are entrusted with the oracles of God. We are entrusted with the call, the clarion call for Messiah to come back. Baruch Ababa Shem Adonai. We're entrusted with that. But the Gentiles of today, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, are also God's chosen people to provoke Israel to jealousy. Yes, Romans 11. And for thousands of years the Gentiles have been provoking us but in a wrong way but haven't made us jealous <laughs> that's right <laughs> but the persistence of this one that, 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 that knocked on your door kept knocking on your door persistently knocking on your door knocking on your door is a fulfillment of what I believe that Carl Gallows is also fulfilling and that is a light to the nations that would emanate so that the nations would come to understand uh, the truth of the gospel. So, Rabbi Zev is Tel Aviv. Carl Gallops is uh, Gulf Coast of Florida. Milton, <laughs> Florida. How do these worlds collide? Yeah, supernaturally, miraculously, by the hand of God. I've, I've written about it in my book called The Rabbi Who Found Messiah. Zev and I have another huge monumental work that's coming out probably four, five, six months from now. We're working on it together right now, a big project, already have a publisher, etc. cetera, uh, because there's so much more to that story. I mean, it has just blossomed around the world and people have come forward with more information and now people are finally talking that didn't want to talk earlier on. So, and I tell it again in this work coming out, but how we met, supernatural, and here's how. Zev, of course, you've heard part of his story right. in Israel. He grew up there and in, in, on the west coast of, of the United States a little bit, but mainly born and raised in Israel. I grew up in the United States, Gulf Coast primarily, been a pastor there. In the meantime, this whole phenomena of Rabbi Yitzhak Kaduri, which is a long story, but the bottom line is one of the most famous, one of the most venerated, revered Kabbalists Orthodox uh, rabbis in the history of modern Israel. Um, he, he died at about 106 to 108. Nobody really knows exactly how old he was. Um, and, and, and the streets of Jerusalem were closed for days. 300,000 people came to the funeral. The president of Israel at that time gave the eulogy. This man was revered. He was involved in politics, etc. So I, I'm watching all this, and then he leaves a note that was posted on his website a year later. It was written in a Kabbalistic code, but it, when it was decoded, basically it said the name of the real Messiah is Yehoshua, Yeshua, G what we would call Jesus. And, and it rocked the world, and of course the Orthodox Jews began to shut the story down. Evangelical Christians were running to the story saying, yes, this, this rabbi says Jesus, but then they started studying his background and Kab you know, a, a, a Kabbalah teacher and the mysticism and the magic and the occult that's involved in that. So a lot of Christians were pushing back from it. So this whole big uh, uh, mess of a story that was so controversial all over the world arose and 
the Lord put it on my heart to dig into this. You know, I used to be an investigator, a cop. Right. And so I, I wrote this book. I, I studied it for years. I pulled it all apart. I got every source I could. I wrote the book about that. Little did I know that there was a man in Israel whose family was deeply connected to this story. His grandfather, great-grandfather, knew Rabbi Kaduri personally. Rabbi Kaduri's name was spoken of in their home all the time because of this relationship. Ariel Sharon, who's a part of this story, actually spent the night in your grandmother's house. Yes. Right? They, so their family's connected to Ariel Sharon. He's a part of that story. It's all in the books. And, 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 and so I, I came across this guy because Zev Parat, because of his connection, after that whole story broke, there were videos on the internet of this guy in Israel who speaks, born and raised, speaks Hebrew as his first language, speaks perfect English. He's sitting down at a picnic table in a park interviewing Rabbi Kaduri students who are left behind, who are believers in Yeshua because of the teaching in, the, in his uh, yeshiva. And, and I said to myself, I, I'm writing this, I said, oh my gosh, if the students understood that Kaduri meant the Jesus that we know, the Yeshua we know, this is amazing. So I said, I don't know who this Zeph Parad is, but so I included him and his videos in my book. Yeah, it's a long story. I'm making it short, though. I'm sorry. But, but it's, it's, it's so miraculous how this happened because I didn't know him. He didn't know me. Our worlds were totally apart. We'd never even heard of each other before. Had no way of contacting each other. But I'm writing this book. I'm doing this investigation. I find him on the Internet. I look at his videos. I see what's happening. I hear the testimony of these students. It's, I said, this has got to go in the book. This is amazing. So I put it all in the book. Anyway, book comes out 2013. You said how in five years ago your life turned around? Five years ago your life turned around? It was five years ago when my life turned around. And now the Lord's brought the three of us together. But the bottom line is, so the book goes out. Now I'm telling you, in my new work coming out, I go way back and tell the story. When that book came out, I was proud to have written it. I immersed myself. I tried to get the facts as straight as I could get them. I wanted it to be a, a well-received work as far as the, the legitimacy of what I wrote. But I was anxious because I knew the Orthodox Jews would hate it. Most Western Christians wouldn't get it. Messianic Jews, I thought maybe they would get it, but I don't know. Those living in Israel aren't going to like it because it's going to stir up a problem for them. And then I thought, who's going to read this? <laughs> who's going to care about it? And then people started wanting to interview me. And I thought, how am I going to explain this in a little sound bite? I mean, it's so deep. It's so complex. So in the meantime, it's a long story, but I'll make this real short. There was a, some people in the United States who had read the book. I didn't know them from anybody. They live way up in Indiana. And, and, and they called me out of the clear blue one day and said, who are you? How, what's a Gentile preacher on the Gulf Coast doing writing about this Kabbalistic Jew in, in Israel, and I thought, well, here, here's some of that persecution. Here's, and, and then they explained, no, 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 we're connected to Israel. We used to live in Israel. We go to Israel. I've spoken before the Sanhedrin Council. I said, are you a Jew? No, I'm a, I'm a Messianic, and I'm a Christian. I'm a, I'm a believer. Um, but we've got deep connections in Israel, and we still go there. And, and we read your book, and we were there when Ariel Sharon was hospitalized with the coma. We, we were there when they were talking about Kaduri and the note. We were there. We know all about this. But how do you know about this? And why would you even care? And I just told him, I said, that's the way my brain thinks. And I said, and I saw it, and I, I, I wrote the book. I said, I just researched it for months and months and months and months. That's how I know about it. They said, we're going to Israel. We're taking your book. And by the way, we read this book. We don't know this Zev Parat fellow that you wrote about that was speaking to the, but we're going to find him, and we're going to take your material to him. I said, that's really cool. They came from Indiana down to Florida to meet with me personally, to make sure I was for real. They still thought that, you know, they just couldn't get it in their mind. Why would I, an ex-cop and a Gentile and a Baptist preacher, why would I write such a book? Well, they went to Israel. They hunted him down. He was skeptical because he's had people try to abuse his ministry before and make him promises, and he, he didn't know. But he meets with them. When they gave him the material, he and his wife, Lynn, were overwhelmed, Rabbi Eric, because they had been praying. While my wife and I were in America praying 
Lord, give me wisdom on this. This book is scaring me now because it's out there. The Jews hate it. The Christians don't get it. But if, I could, if we could get it into the hands of, of Jews in Israel who will read about their rabbi, their beloved rabbi, and find out for themselves because the media in Israel was shutting it down. The Orthodox elite, they were shutting it down. They were threatening people that would even speak of this story or the note. His own son was denying Oh, oh yes. Oh, and I go into all of that in the right. book. So, so, so in the meantime, my wife and I are back here in the United States praying. I say in my new book coming out, there were only four people in the world praying this prayer. Me and my wife, Zev and his wife, and we didn't even know each other. But I was praying, Lord, get this into the hands of Jews in Israel. I don't care if anybody else gets it or likes it or believes it, but there will be people who will be saved if they can read this. And it's not written like a pamphlet of, of an evangelistic pamphlet you would hand out. It's just, it's, it just tells the story. So the Jewish mind, you know how that works. I want to give me the facts. Give me the facts. Right. I, don't preach to me. Give me the facts. So the book is written that way. So in the meantime, my, pe- my friends met me. They, they saw I was for real. They went to Israel. They hunted him down. They met him in a restaurant. They give him this stuff. He and his wife are very emotional about it. They said, you wouldn't know this. But my wife and I were praying. See, we knew the story was accurate. I, he was saying, I know the students. I know the Kaduris. My family knows the Kaduris. We know all about this. But when we go to the streets and try to tell it, we're called a liar. So we needed somebody to put it in writing, to research the facts, to put it in a journalistic fashion. And you're telling me we've been sitting here praying this and you're putting it in my hand from America? from the Gulf Coast, and then he asks, who is this Baptist preacher? Why does he care? And then they explained what they knew about me. Next thing you know, he's asking them, can you give me his email? Can you give me something? We're, we exchange a few emails. We get on the phone. We talk. We fell in love with each other immediately. We've been friends since. We've been all over the world together doing conferences and ministry and, and writing another big book and a project. And that's, that's, that's the short story, believe right. it or not. But it's, um, it's miraculous. I mean, there's no way that could happen other than the hand of God. Right. Amazing. We're talking with Carl Gallops and Messianic Rabbi Zeb Parat uh, from Tel Aviv and from Milton, Florida, here on this special two-hour edition of the Carl Gallops Hour. We're going to hone in on these prophecies. Isaiah 53, so many ways to look at it. The depth of understanding it requires to put it into place and really goes contrary to what uh, Zev and I have been taught is that it is about Israel and not about the Messiah. But when we come back, I'm going to add another perspective to this that I'm going to ask Rabbi Zev if it is actually what I think it might be. We're going to take a short break. Stay tuned. We'll be back after these short messages. Back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Igniting a Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four-hour daily Christian television 
talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The Teaching Archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, Prophecy in the News videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices and who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, welcoming you into a special edition of the Carl Gallup's Hour, a two-hour special live in studio with Carl Gallup's to my left and Rabbi Zev Parat to my right, a friendship that was birthed in the kingdom of God that's brought together from the really three corners of the earth, if you consider Pittsburgh a corner. <laughs> Yeah. Milton, Florida corner and Tel Aviv corner, when we triangulate, yes. we actually wind up in a flipped over triangle here in Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> yes, we so we're delighted to have you in studio. Uh, Carl, I'm fascinated by the Kadori story. Of course, I read uh, the first book I had you on. Uh, I, that might have been the first time you and I met was an interview about that book. Yeah, and yeah. What, what took place was uh, the feedback from the audience was like, how long have you two known each other? Uh, the dynamic between you two is so easy. You both have this grace about you that says not right or wrong, but a deep explora exploration, uh, uh, discovery, and points of view and points of light and perspective. So Carl set it up to talk about the story of Rabbi Kadori. And for an audience that doesn't know, this was a uh, revered uh, Rebbe with an incredible following uh, who uh, was, was considered to be uh, one of the many sages. Uh, we look back through time, we look at the Rambam, Maimonides, we look at Rabbi Akiva, uh, we look at uh, even Rabbi Schneerson uh, for whatever your feelings are as to the Lubavitch or Chabad movement, uh, just the same way I happen to feel about Charles Spurgeon or uh, Calvin or anybody else, uh, revered. Uh, 
wisdom pours out of the pores of of these uh, revered, revered scholars. We don't have to agree with them. The only thing we have to agree with is the Word of God, but their illumination into different corners and keeping an active mind about this. And Rabbi Kador was one of those. He was one who had a following, and the following was on a national level. He was that esteemed. And so his profession of faith that was revealed after his death in saying that by his own words, his own research, his own understanding, after his death he wanted to be revealed that he believed that Yeshua, Jesus, was the promised Jewish Messiah. You've heard Rabbi Zev's testimony about how he came to faith, but also I want to get his point of view as an Israeli uh, Orthodox Jew, knowing of the teachings of Rabbi Kadori and what this discovery, how it impacted you, your family, uh, your belief in what he believes in, and I also want to talk about the cost. Yeah. The cost that you and I, different than Gentiles, when they come to faith, they don't know about counting the cost. Yeah. They might in China. And you can, you, 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 you know firsthand. Um, a lot of ministry there. Yeah. A lot of ministry there. You know about North Korea. You know about the communist or the uh, dictatorships uh, where faith is suppressed. But you and I, you and I had to count the loss of 14 million blood relatives of being willing to count the cost that says if we make a public profession of faith in Yeshua, I'm going to be denied citizenship in my homeland because of the government's policies to not allow, even though my mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, great-grandmother, great-great-great-great-great-great-great, all the way back, 16 generations, I have the papers of both families, pure Jewish on both sides is not enough to overcome my profession of faith in yes. my public forum, yes. public format of books yes. published in many languages, uh, still have to count the cost of uh, the decision that I made to follow Yeshua as my Messiah. Your story, more complicated as a Sabra, uh, born in Israel, born into, truly into the rabbinate. Uh, this was to be the mantle that was going to be placed on your shoulders and the expectation of your family for you to become like a Kaduri, uh, like a Schneerson, like uh, a Rabbi Akiva, uh, that they had hoped that you would become counted among the Orthodox rabbis of Israel. But yet your story converges with Carlos about Rabbi Kadori, And yet it was on a personal level as opposed to the other side of this of telling the story. Mm -hmm. Give me your point of view on the Kadori story. Well, first of all, Rabbi Kadori would be somebody like, uh, like uh, the, the one who just passed away in America. Billy Graham. Billy Graham, yes. Yeah, to the like Billy Graham. Graham. Like Everybody mm -hmm. knows who Billy Graham is, whether they believe in Jesus or they don't believe in Jesus. Right. He was in the White House. He was... Uh, big political figure in the same way Rabbi Yitzchak Kaduri. But Rabbi Yitzchak Kaduri was also uh, the top main rabbi. You mentioned uh, several rabbis. It was also the Rabbi Shach, the famous Rabbi Shach who passed away uh, several years ago, the Ashkenazi side. Even Rabbi Shach sat down with Rabbi Kaduri and they were friends. Something you don't always see, the Ashkenazi and the Sephardi sitting down because they have different point of views. But he was really the, the top rabbi in the past 200 years, I would say, mm -hmm. in Israel. Something like Rabbi Akiva. Maybe even more. Some say maybe even more in this generation. And when he passed away, as Carl said, there were 300,000 people in his funeral. I think there were more than 300,000. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the reports say at least 300,000. More than yeah. 300,000. It was packed. I remember it. And everybody expected in the Orthodox movement that when that note would be opened, it would probably say, maybe I'm the Messiah, one yes. of the rabbis thought. Yeah. Right. Or maybe, yes. Yes. maybe it's his son somebody, giving somebody it to... Somebody in Israel. Somebody in Israel giving it to David Kaduri. And when the note was opened in that decoded uh, format, they immediately, they made one mistake, which I believe God allowed it. It wasn't a mistake. They put it on the website. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Before they decoded it. Why they put it on the website before they decoded it is supernatural. Because if they would have decoded it, 
they would never put it on the website. I, they would have tossed it away. In I that. think God blinded their eyes. They didn't know how to decode it. They didn't know how. At to, first. Yeah. It, they just put it on the website. And, and the surface text was so Kabbalistic. It was just a general statement about a Messiah. Mm -hmm. But there was no name there yeah. until you decoded there it. There was no name. So they assumed it was somebody in Israel. They just put it on the website. And about two months later, uh, they opened it. They decoded, decoded it. it. And I remember there's a, a back story over here that you could probably find it on the internet. They also, they also took that off the internet for various reasons. One of the rabbis that opened it was uh, Kaduri's right-hand man, Yosef. And Rabbi Yosef opened it and he fainted. He fainted right there when he opened it. When he, he knew what it was. You mean when he decoded it? When he decoded it. He, yeah. There was 5,000 people over yeah. there when he decoded it. Be and he was, taken, he was taken to the hospital, yeah, go ahead, and, and, and Rabbi Yosef died. Wow. You need to understand, when they read in that note that Yehoshua or Yeshua is the Messiah, it shocked the Orthodox movement. Yeah. I was excited about it. We were just using that note everywhere, yes. but something happened. Yeah. Can I break in and just explain how the note was decoded and what it meant, and then keep going, because what you're saying is, is wild. But, but the note just said... In English, I mean, he wrote it in Hebrew, but it said, concerning the letter abbreviation of his name, now his, that meant the Messiah, because he had promised his followers, I'm going to leave the Messiah's name in a note to be put on my website one year after my death. So the note said, concerning the letter abbreviation of his name, comma, well, there was no comma, but it says, he shall he shall raise his people and prove that the word of God is just. So that's all. Yeah. Now, that's how it's in English. That's a bunch of words. But so it was put on the website. Now, if you're just reading the surface text, and this is what I'm saying, God blinded the eyes of the average Jew. Because on, in, in the text, it's just like, oh, well, okay. So when Messiah comes, he will raise his people and, and, and prove that the word of God is accurate. And they said, okay, well, it just sounds like something a Kabbalistic rabbi would say. But then they kept thinking, but he said the name was in there, the name. And then they saw that first sentence again, concerning the letter abbreviation of his name. And we know the, the Kabbalah way. Well, not just Kabbalah way, the Bible way, Psalm 119. It's an acrostic all the way through. There's letter abbreviations. Each paragraph starts with each successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And, and, and there are other psalms like that, and there are other passages in, in the Old Testament like that. So they said, oh my gosh, get rid of the first sentence and take that last statement. And it was made up of six Hebrew words. It translates into English as, he shall raise his people and prove that the word of God is accurate. But that only takes six Hebrew words. Mm -hmm. When they took the first letter of each of those six Hebrew words, which is the letter abbreviation, it's spelled out Yahushua, Yahushua, which is the long form of Yeshua, which is Jesus, which that rabbi, when he saw it, he fainted, went to the hospital. CVA, it's like, he got CVA. That would be like Billy Graham declaring right. in a note after his death that, that Muhammad is the real Messiah. Right. I mean, Christians would faint and die. Now keep telling the story, because now, that's what happened. Absolutely, and I, I believe they had it on his website because they knew they were going to decode it, and they want it when they make the proclamation, okay, we know who the Messiah is, and Ahmed right. is the Mashiach. It are, it's already on his website, and everybody would just rush to the website and see it, but it backfired on them. God had a master plan. <laughs> <laughs> and they, st they did everything to suppress the story. Uh, we were using it as an evangelistic tool, but we ran into a brick wall. The Orthodox movement, especially Yad Lachim, the anti missionary organization in Israel founded the deprogrammed believers, were doing everything they can to suppress the story to say it was a lie they said the rabbi wasn't he was sick he wasn't healthy well he was on television up to the time he passed away he was in the Knesset up to the time he passed away even the basketball coach Pini Gershon of Maccabi Tel Aviv came to him for blessings before every game he was healthy right and we ran into a brick wall and the Jews were not listening anymore they were so brainwashed that it was a lie and we just, we just stopped at 2008 until something happened in 2012. Something happened. I was coming back from an outreach at 11 p.m. in Tel Aviv. And an Orthodox Jew walks up to my window 
knocks on the window, and he wants to give me a postcard, but I, you know, it was 11 o'clock at night. I didn't want to open You were at a red light. I was at a red light. Lynn said, you know, leave it alone now. You're going to get into a long conversation. But the Holy Spirit kept on nugging me. Open the window. Open the window. And I open the window, and he takes a flyer of Rabbi Yitzchak Adur, and he sticks it in the window. It was, looked to me total, total Kabbalistic. And I said, I can't, I can't accept this from you. And the Holy Spirit said, tell him, tell him. And he said, why not? I said, because I believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. And he said, so do I. And at that moment, I said, let's meet over the light. We met over the light. His name was Eliyahu. And apparently, he was one of Rabbi Yitzchak Kaduri's students. And Rabbi Yitzchak Kaduri in the Yeshiva, in Nacharat Yitzchak Yeshiva, in Jerusalem, was teaching to some group. I don't know what, how he chose that group, but to some sector, privately, quietly, who the Messiah was. What I learned was he didn't teach the whole gospel. That certain uh, student did not know about the resurrection. That's when God started to bring these students to me one by one, and we were sharing, and, and they started to come, come to faith, praise Yeshua. But the Jews in the street were still not listening. The Jews in the synagogues were still not listening. And we prayed, and I said, Surely you had the most venerated rabbi in Israel believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. Surely you have a master plan here. It can't be that the story is going to be suppressed. He started to pray and pray and pray. It was about 2013 when, when Carl wrote the book. We didn't know each other, as, as you said. You didn't know about the book? And I was praying that God would open a way to use this powerful rabbi to get the word out that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah. Because as you know, you grew up as a Jew too. You know that Jews read the Bible under rabbinic interpretations. Right. Rashi, Adak, they always take at face value what the rabbis have to say. And here we have a rabbi, a rabbi of rabbis who actually is the one that the rabbis in Israel go to. They go to to ask questions. They believe his authority and he confesses that Yeshua is the Messiah. Surely there must be something to this. I'm praying. And one day I, re I receive many emails and, you know, we, we can't answer every email because sometimes we're suspicious or something. But this certain email popped out to me several times. We want to meet you. We have something for you. We want to meet you. God says, go. That's when I met the couple from Indiana, Chuck and Tammy. Yeah. And they gave me the, the book, The Rabbi I Found a Sign. I was excited. Now, besides the note in the book, it shows all the history of Rabbi Kaduri. And the Jews know the history of Rabbi Kaduri from Iraq and everything. So they, they know the book is genuine as far as the historical side of it. But I didn't know what was in the book. I was excited, the rabbi who knows Messiah, you know. And I, want, I had to read the book. Because before I could start using a book, I need to know what's inside that yes, book. Yes. I got on a train uh, going to an, uh, an outreach in Haifa from Tel Aviv. I'm sitting on a train, minding my own business, reading the book, The Rabbi Who Found Messiah. And soldiers, IDF soldiers, are sitting aside of, in front of me, and they're saying, is that a new book about Rabbi Kaduri? Did he write that? His picture was on the front. It's, yeah. It's drawn like a magnet. And I said, well, it, it's about Rabbi Kaduri. He didn't write it, but there's a revelation inside that he did write. Tell us, tell us, tell us. Hey, they're asking, right? Asking you shall receive. Right? Yeah. And I started to share with them. And before I knew it, half of the train was listening to the gospel. And I realized that this book, I mean, yeah. there's no revival without the word of God, but if the Jews want to know what the rabbis have to say, then we'll let him know what the rabbi had to say. Yeshua, Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah. And Kaduri's handwriting, his note is in that book. It's reproduced. And so they're sitting there looking at his handwriting and the coding, and they can see the six letters, Yeshua, Yeshua. And then I realized this is an evangelistic tool. And from that time on, before we met, I started to use it as an evangelistic tool. And then we met face to face later on, years later on. And as Carl said, we're mm -hmm. in ministry together right now. But once again, they did everything to suppress the truth, but God has His timing, and His timing started after the five years, and we all here experienced that supernatural right. breakthrough. Right. You know, it's, it's so interesting to watch through both lenses, because I go to Israel every year, I saw you in Israel, uh, I spend a great deal of time every year preparing and planning and, and in communication, and I'm watching uh, a CBN report came out uh, about a month ago that says approximately 871,000 Jews who have at least one Jewish parent in North America have accepted Jesus 
as the Messiah. 871,000. That's amazing. Now, in Israel, when I first started going there, there was a couple, maybe 1,500 believers. Now there's in the 25 to 30,000 believers. When I went there, there were 20 congregations. Now there's like 300 congregations. But what people have to understand, the Word of God, before our audience starts saying, well, how come they can't see it? How come they can't perceive it? How come they can't understand it? It's right there in front of their face because God said so. He said, they'll have eyes to see, but will not be seen. They'll have ears to hear, but will not be understanding. And he says, I'm going to bring my people back to the land first in unbelief. Mm. First in unbelief. It's according to the word of God. That This is exactly how it's supposed to be. We're not to be coming. All of Israel will be saved. Yes, but not yet. But yet, while there's work to be done, these two, to my right and to my left, are doing the work of the Lord in the land as we try to continue to support the work of the Lord in the land. And it is because of biblical prophecy, the prophecy of Jew and Gentile becoming one in Messiah. Ephesians 2, right here, right now, live, in studio, right here in Birmingham, Alabama. You're seeing what God said from the two, I shall make one. The concept of ethnos was introduced by the Greeks. It's about race, and it has to do with what the model of the perfect of each race is. The Greeks had the Adonis. As you looked at it, you said, oh, this is the perfect man. It has nothing to do with what man describes. In the Bible, it says from the two, Jew and Gentile, he shall make one. And, and one of the incredible end time signs is till the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. We're looking at a setup in Israel of understanding of new light. Uh, or Elohim, the light of God, is now shining into the very recesses of homes, reaching people on buses, trains, cleaning up beaches, uh, ministering in multicultural environments of congregations which have uh, Ethiopians, Russians, Arabs, uh, Arab Christians, uh, Jews, Jewish believers, uh, immigrants from all over the world coming together uh, as it was in Acts chapter 2. Those languages that we heard, the praying in, were Amen. all the Jewish languages of those who had been dispersed. Yes. And if you, my beloved audience, do not understand what happened in 586 B.C. and the Babylonian captivity, if you don't understand 70 A.D., if you don't understand the book of Daniel, Daniel 9, which tells us that the anointed one will be cut off before the destruction of the second That's right. temple. That's right. We're told a timeline, and there is only one who came before the destruction of the second temple. Our atonement, all of this that you and I believe in, we talk about the Lamb's book of life, you and I each year would go from the uh, first day of the seventh month until the tenth day of the seventh month. We would be in a period of uh, the days of awe, the, the time of reconciliation as we began to repair yeah. relationships and brokenness so that we could do what Yeshua said. If you bring your gift to the altar and realize there your brother has something against you, go leave your gift, your gift and go be reconciled, then come bring it. So we have this ten day period, the Day of Atonement, the only day in all of Jewish history where the word take away applies to our sin. And that was an unintentional sin. But we see the hand of the priest laying upon the goat, transferring the sins of the people. And we see Rome laying their hands on Yeshua, transferring the sin of Rome. We see Israel laying their hands on Yeshua, transferring the sin of Israel to his back. And now, all of our righteousness like filthy rags. What was he wearing as he was in the city walls? Filthy, bloody rags on his back. And because he was no longer without blemish or spot, he had to be taken out of the city, taken to the place, Golgotha, where the dump was, where the, the offal of the sacrifice was taken. The unclean parts were taken outside the city walls. And he's crucified. And then he's crowned. He's crowned on a day, uh, 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 Rosh Hashanah uh, Hamelech, uh, the, the, the new year of the king, on the same day as all the other kings of Israel, in the same month as all the other kings of Israel are crowned. Rome, in their zeal to 
to offend and break the backs of the Jews, crown him on the same day that the other kings of Israel have been crowned. And now when he returns, not on a donkey, which is a vehicle of peace, but on a horse, a vehicle of war, he comes and he takes up his throne with no coronation whatsoever. Not in the history of Israel have we ever had a king Take the throne, there wasn't a coronation, there wasn't a ceremony, wasn't, but he already had He's already, his coronation. That's right. He was already crowned. Therefore, when he comes, he takes up his throne. And this is such an incredible picture that God has given us. I can't be more excited. Our audience needs to understand yeah. there's more to what you're being taught. There's more to. You are responsible for your own literacy. You cannot do what we did, which was hang on every word of our rabbi and believe that he was the intermediary. He was the intercessor on our behalf that we could not possess the knowledge or the understanding. But when we had an interfilling of the Holy Spirit, we were set free. There was an explosion of atomic proportion, a nuclear reaction within our spirits that set us free to be able to finally see the scriptures through the lens of God. We're gonna take a short break and when we come back, Hour number two. I can't tell you how excited I am to have these two dear brothers in the Lord with me. Carl Gallops, Rabbi Zev Parat from Tel Aviv. We'll be right back. back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatic Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live, four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day, you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings 
interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices and who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Back. Shalom and welcome to this special edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and for a two-hour special edition of the Carl Gallup's Hour, we have live in studio my good friend Zev Parat, Rabbi from Tel Aviv, Israel, my dear friend and brother, Pastor Carl Gallup's, a prolific author, and uh, P.P. Simmons, Dot com, the uh, PNN News Network. Always so great to see you. I just saw you uh, weeks ago in uh, the Galilee as we had dinner and we kind of shared uh, war stories uh, of a different kind. <laughs> spiritual uh, war stories. Spiritual war <laughs> stories of a different kind. Uh, it's very interesting because you just came from uh, preaching in uh, as you preached in many churches, uh, the average churchgoer never hears about Israel. Uh, the people groups mentioned in prophecy, uh, they're divided over Israel, Jerusalem, the Palestinians, lack of understanding of Islam in general. There's a rise in anti-Semitism, replacement theology, and the myth that the Jewish people have universally rejected Yeshua, and might even be culpable in the killing of Jesus, and this was the theology of uh, Constantine, this was the theology that was passed down even up into the Vatican in 1973 when they finally issued a statement that says, we no longer blame the Jews for killing Jesus. <laughs> well, to the Jew, what do we hear? Mm -hmm. So you finally confessed that for 1,500 years you've been blaming us for killing That's Jesus. Right. We don't look at the apology. We look at the confession. Right. Okay? Uh, you, you no longer blame us. So are you sorry? Are you sorry you were complicit in the Holocaust? Are you sorry for the poisonous fruit that you have fed to the in, people? The Inquisitions. That, that, that mm -hmm. continued, the Crusades, the Inquisition, the Holocaust, all these things. But, but... You've been alive for about 75% of Israel's history. You've seen a change from the uh, doubling in size in just a five-year period. You've seen a change of immigration. You've seen a change in schools. You've seen a change in the landscape. You've seen a change in the faith, faith at work. Uh, this was the first year that I came to Israel that I didn't get into a verbal debate at the wall. Uh, maybe it's because they've seen me, maybe because of my black leather kippot, uh, maybe because it's a message to them that, the, that I, I, do wear, I do wear black in compassion and sympathy for the message to the morning of the destruction of the Second Temple, but no arguments this time, and no, no um, uh, in the old city right there by uh, Shor Shorshim, uh, the Burger Brothers shop. Okay, I usually have somebody trying to tie a red, but they were, they were playing clarinet music and they weren't as uh, in your face this time. Uh, 
uh, I noticed there was a softening. And if they tell me, you know, do I want a blessing? And they hold out their hand, and I say, I'll give you a blessing for nothing, B'Shem Yeshua. And they go screaming, 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 screaming at the wall, yelling at me, going to the other rabbis, pointing, pointing. This time, nothing. It was almost as if, okay, the Christian tourists are coming. They're the lifeblood of the land. They're believers. And the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Israel are embracing uh, this incredible merging of cultures and ideologies and faith and the evangelicals are putting the financial support uh, putting their shoulder to the plow in Israel and doing great work and the government's responding by by ejecting many Gentiles over the last five years many have not had their visas renewed because of evangelism and because of the sympathetic tone and appreciative, appreciative tone of Benjamin Netanyahu. So there are churches, the church in Indonesia, the church in South Korea, the church in Japan are flocking to Israel. The church in America is still not grabbed a hold and still listening to this watered down truth that Islam is a religion of peace, that the Jews are oppressing the Palestinians, and they have this perception, and they're so confused, and I have to tell them very boldly, anti-Jewish is anti-Jesus. Anti-Israel right. is anti-Jesus. How, how are you seeing things change over your last years of uh, coming to faith and seeing the impact of, of the gospel going through? This. Well, for, well, first of all, I want to answer your last question, your last statement. Anti-Israel is anti-Yeshua. That's true. It's clear. We talk a lot about, about fake news in America and around the world. There's also fake churches. Right. And that's a, that's a harsh statement, but it's true. No, it is. If you're rejecting the message of Israel, then you're not the real church Thank of God. You. I agree. You, that, is, that is exactly what Yeshua preached on, the sheep and the goats. You are a goat believer. And I, I don't think people understand this Edomite connection that's going back to Esau. Esau was described as hairy. Hmm. Now you look at a goat. When you describe a goat, a goat is hairy, a sheep is woolly. Okay? So we go all the way back to Esau. We see the Edomites. We see the Edomite influence of Herod, okay? half Edomite, who tried to kill Yeshua, and this spiritual, physical DNA at, uh, in, in, in the body. And, and Jesus said, the sheep and the goats, they're both believers. But are you a sheep believer taking care of the least of my brothers? Or are you a goat believer that rejects Israel? Having said that, because we're living in the 70th year of the nation of Israel, because we're seeing Bible prophecy fulfilled before our very eyes, and again, I'm not setting any dates. I'm not a date setter. But there's never been a generation closer to the second coming of Jesus than this generation. When we see sin escalating to a new level, and it has escalated to a very high level in Israel, almost everything is tolerant. At the same time, the gospel is also getting out. What you experience at the Kotel and the Wailing Wall is part of that. They're being more tolerant. Okay, you believe in Yeshua? All right, that's your phase. It's okay. I'm not saying there's not persecution. There is. But I am saying that there is a certain tolerance. And in that motivation for tolerance, the gospel is getting out. Last week, uh, very heartbreaking for me as an Israeli, uh, even to speak about it is heartbreaking. Last week, we had the, the parade in Israel, in, in, in Tel Aviv. 273,000 people, and they're boasting that it's the 70th year of the nation of Israel. We're seeing the war between Amalek and Yeshua. That war continues. I'll have war with Amalek from generation to generation. This is the gay pride parade. That's the gay pride right. parade, yes. Yeah. Yes, I was At the same I time. was gentle to say it, yes. Yeah. Well, no, that's what it was. Yeah. But, and again, Orthodox Jews, the, the rabbinic movement of Israel is two blocks away from the opening of that gay parade, and they do nothing. But yet, if we do a parade with not 273,000, with 270 Messianic Jews, it'll cause a riot. You know, Zev, what's so interesting is that it is paralleled here in the United States. With 72% of Americans saying that they're Christian, we should have 72% of the Senate 
being Christians. We should have 72% of the, of, the, of the House. We should have 72% of the White House. We should not be able to legislate abortion. We should not be able to legislate same-sex marriage. But we have a divided body of Messiah uh, that these are truly the days of Noah while they're going about their business and every inclination of the imagination of their hearts are evil. You have the the one first time we see the word righteous being used in the Hebrew text of, of uh, uh, Genesis 7, uh, f Genesis 6 and, and Genesis 7, this, this righteousness is being established uh, as you can be set apart. And we were called to be a people set apart, but so is the church called to be set apart. This is a holy priesthood. This is in the order of Melchizedek. This is, this is now we have. And it, it's so interesting to see the parallels in both the natural and the supernatural to what's happening in Israel and the United States of this tolerance. But the contrast to it is this heavy religious burden. And I've found that the spirit of Baal manifests itself as a sexual spirit. Wherever there was, sure. you remember, they, sure. they, 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 they conquered the prophets of Baal, and the men ran down and still took the women. Yeah. Right? Because even though the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God, they still ran down the hill and took the beautiful women. It's the number one sin in the Bible that's written over and over again. Yes. Yep. And so we're seeing this in Israel. We're seeing it in the United States. And so it, it runs a path of the same Holy Spirit, the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and we're seeing that. So this generation, the closest generation, I completely agree, to, agree with you. Uh, the fig tree prophecy. Uh, I'm, I'm one who uh, uh, is looking at the calendar, looking at scripture and saying that on the Hallel calendar we're at 5778 and I was raised under Hallel. Right? So that was always my calendar. But there's new discoveries out of the Essenes, the one who gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls, that there's an arithmetic calendar that sets the same date every year. And now I'm beginning to question this concept in, in uh, Scripture, in, in Peter, that says to, uh, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. Does that connect to the six days of creation? Can we look at it like a Y6K scenario that says that after 6,000 years from the day of man, will Messiah come? And I know we can't set times and dates, but when we look at this, is there, and we know Hillel changed the calendar. We know that. He, he says, this, this is, my, and so is it 200 years? Is it 195 years? Is it 210? That's the variable we don't know, but requires great study and great in-depth looking to see if we can find out where we are, because I believe that in my lifetime, I'm 66 and a half years old, but the fig tree blossomed, mm -hmm. and this generation will not pass away until seeing the great day of the coming of the Lord. Is that the tribulation? Is that the desecration, the abomination of desecration? Is that the return of mm -hmm. Messiah? Mm -hmm. What is the day of the Lord? Yeah, and I think, I, I think one of the key factors in discerning the time in which we live is so simple, it's right before our eyes. Everything you're talking about is fascinated, it's interconnected to all of this, but it has to do with the fact we are the first generation in 2,600 years to see a revenant nation of Israel. We are now in the 70th year of that. And in that 70th year, that same year, one year after the Jubilee, well, in the Jubilee year, the year before last, the law was signed in the Jubilee year 2017, which matches the jubilee before that, was 1967. And the law was signed, is Jerusalem belongs to Israel. In 1967, Israel said, after the Six Day War, Jerusalem belongs to Israel. Yes. In 2017, in the next jubilee, the United States says, and then the world says, and then Israel agrees, Jerusalem belongs to Israel. That was then made the capital officially and the home of the U.S. Embassy in the 70th year. I mean, this, this stuff is so prophetic. And we're the first generation in 2,700 years to see this all come down to, to converge to a pinpoint. 
And then when you look at what the rest of the world, the meltdown of the Middle East, Turkey collapsing into an Ottoman Empire, Russia in the Middle East, China in the Middle East, connected to Iran, the whole stuff with North Korea and, 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 and Syria, and it's just astounding. So you're right. I mean, we may not know the exact calendar date, and I think you're probably onto something with all that other, but the bottom line is one thing that's right before us, there is the promised Israel, and we are now in the 70th year, which, of course, from Daniel is a very important number. Very important. <laughs> yeah, so that's Absol absolutely. And also, as you said, 2017, Donald Trump does the impossible. Yeah. He signs what no president was willing to do from 1995, ordained by God, because, and again, we're right. not saying Donald Trump is an angel. Right. We are saying that God is using, using him for him. such a yeah. time like this. That's why he's being persecuted. That's why Benjamin Netanyahu is being persecuted. They're trying to take both of them out. Why is it? It's spiritual warfare. God's in The enemy knows <laughs> that his days are numbered. The yes. enemy knows that the key is Israel. Yeah. But if we look at 2017, which you mentioned is the year of the Jubilee, 2018, it happens in the 70th year of the nation of Israel. But 2018, eight is a number of new beginnings in the Bible. We know yes. that. Yes. I believe we're in a time right now of the new wine and the new skin. Yeah. We're in that time right now. I think so. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. The, I took my group to the embassy. We had a picture, all of us wearing a shirt that said Alabama in Hebrew. Good. You gave me one. Yes, <laughs> I did. <laughs> yes, it says Alabama in Hebrew to uh, make a point that Alabama was the first state to vote. Of course, it was an alphabetical vote, so they call by yes. state. Al yes. Alabama is the first state. And it's become. long in Hebrew. It's yes. long. Right. It's and, very, and, and how do you say Alabama in Hebrew? Alabama. I, say, I knew it. <laughs> yeah, actually, you don't say Alabama. You say Alabama. Alabama. Yeah. Alabama. <laughs> yeah. You have to have the accent. Yes. So with this rise of disinformation, misinformation, and incredible distraction about what goes on in Israel, both from a political, social, contextual, uh, and prophetic standpoint. How do we open the eyes of people to understand that this, this battle goes back to the, uh, some of the oldest prophecies in the Bible? That Ishmael would be a wild donkey among men, all the nations of the world would war against him, and he would war against his brother. This is the Sunni Shiite, and the battle against this, this, this one who I believe that Allah uh, is, is actually Satan himself saying, don't call me Lucifer, don't call me this, refer to me as the angel of light, refer to me as I refer to myself in Isaiah that I'll ascend to the throne of heaven. Uh, listen, Satan doesn't roll off the tongue. Nahash doesn't roll off the tongue. Lucifer doesn't roll off the tongue, but Allah, yeah. right, it just rolls off the tongue. So don't call me these other names. You call me Allah now. And the media still does not speak Arabic and is so prone to say that the lady who went out on the stabbing episode yesterday says, God is great, Allah is great. So, no, it's not what that says. It says Allah is greater. Yes, the greatest. It's Right. Yes. It is relative. Yes. Everything about Islam compares yes. itself to Christianity and Judaism. Yes. Saying that Muhammad is the only. Yes prophet of God. How Allah do we, is I, the greatest yeah, of uh, all yeah. the gods. How do we break this, this, this veil? Uh, the, the scales, listen, you and I, the scales have fallen from our eyes. Okay, so we know that God can remove scales. Otherwise, you and I couldn't be sitting here as two Jewish people that, that uh, it, it's, it, it's funny to me that, that uh, people don't read the New Testament understanding that the Judaizers in the Bible, in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the Brit Hadashah, in the, the New Testament, the Judaizers were all Gentiles. There's never been a Jew that would say to another Jew, you need to be more Jewish. That's true. <laughs> you need to be more Jewish. You're either Jewish or you're not Jewish. How you practice out your Judaism is a personal choice as to whether or not you're Reformed, Conservative, Orthodox, Reconstructionist, Messianic, what, whatever it is you decide to do. But being more Jewish, you need to be more Jewish, isn't a concept that you and I understand. So this was a concept being promoted among the church in Rome, the church in, in, uh, uh, to the Galatians, to the Ephesians, to the, to the Colossians. And so these were not Jews saying you need to take on a Jewish identity. They were Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And we see that in America. Listen, I was named on the eighth day, Abraham Mendel Ber Ben Hirsch. That was the name given to me on the eighth day, on my circumcision, on my Brit Malah. I don't need to change my name to a Hebrew name. I've been given one. But I see people all over changing their names to Hebrew names. 
and they're confused because we're not bringing a message that says that you need to be Jewish to believe in the Messiah. You and I are called to, as Paul says, Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation for all who believe, but to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Well, to the Jew first uh, does not mean to the Jew better. No. Yeah. It just means that God has order. Yes. And the order was from Israel to the nations. Now it's time for the nations to bring the gospel back to Jerusalem. But the nations are grafted into spiritually Israel, Romans 11:17. They need to realize that. And grafted into spiritually Israel does not mean that you have to become a physical Israelite in order to enter into that family. Thank you. God is searching for the heart. He's not searching for... Yes. And we have, uh, I don't know how it is in, in America, but it, the believers in Israel, a lot of them, and in China as well, are constantly searching, what tribe am I from? What tribe am I from? And, and I tell them, you need to be searching for one tribe, and that's the tribe of the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Thank you. Because that's going to be the eternal tribe. Right. You know, everybody right. wants to be a Levite. Okay. <laughs> every, every Jew everywhere, not me, I know what my history is. I know what my lineage is. My, my uh, grandfather on my mother's side was a Kohen, but that means his firstborn son yeah. is a Kohen. And his firstborn son is a Kohen. I'm from my mother of the Kohen. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not a Kohen, and uh, I'm probably looking at who I've been over the last 66 years. I might be Gad. Okay. <laughs> not, okay. not the popular one, a little prickly on the outside, more like a sober, prickly on the outside, soft and mushy on the inside. <laughs> Gadites were kind of like that. Uh, but you know what? I don't care what, mm. what tribe I'm from. I don't care. Uh, what I cared about was the fact when people said to me, when did I convert? I would say, convert to what? Thank you. Well, what, would I just, what would I convert to? When were you completed? I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I believe in the Jewish Messiah. If there was going to be any conversion to take place, it would not be the Jews to convert. It would be the nations if there was a requirement. But praise God, there is no requirement mm -hmm. that access. Look, you and I were natural branches cut off for unbelief. We were in the same pile, the same fire, about to be, and people loved us, and they shared with us, but they loved us, but they, they would say, I'm sorry, I don't want to offend you, but they loved us, they were loving us to death. There's ministries in Israel from the United States that do not support the preaching of the gospel in Israel, saying that one says they have their own covenant through Abraham, and Jesus didn't come to be the Messiah of Israel. That's a lie. Yes. Okay. You have another one that wants to garner a great deal of uh, Knesset and Benjamin Netanyahu friends. Politi politically correct. Uh, politically correct, and 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 he wants to have, uh, he wants to be Switzerland. So yeah. he do, he puts a lot of money, but no gospel. Yeah. Then you have on the other side of it those that will prey upon the Christians to say that you should give your money to these poor impoverished people in Haifa and in these outlying areas, these Russian immigrants, and the money goes to his beautiful mansion in Jerusalem and his high salary in Jerusalem. And you and I and Carl are where the rubber meets the road. This is where we are in the business of ministering the gospel, us through television right now, prime time in the Middle East. Right now, you look at the clock, we're prime time in the Middle East, 8.22 p.m., prime time in the Middle East, where our audience, we're getting salvations in Pakistan, we're getting salvations in Israel, in India, we're getting salvations in Brazil, in Australia. They're writing to us and telling us we watched your program and we know what you're saying is true because you're a straight shooter. We've seen you have 1,000 episodes and you're nothing but a straight shooter. I'll call it for what I see because if we don't, we're sugarcoating the truth of God. And Amen. you and I would have never gone into the car with a man that says, come on, I have a piece of candy. Would you like a piece of candy? Mm -hmm. That's the way the gospel is being presented. Do you want a piece of candy? No, yeah. the gospel is... Get behind me, Satan. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. The truth is the word of God and the church is biblically illiterate and that is no excuse because you and I were literate. We were blinded. But we were blinded. We could read it, but we couldn't understand it. We could see it, but we couldn't perceive it. But that's what the prophecy said about us. That's what Isaiah spoke, the word of God. 
And so when the scales fell from our eyes and we could see the truth, now we become persecuted for being provocateurs of truth. I say, bring it. Mm -hmm. Bring it. Matthew 5.10. Amen. Mm. This is it. Mm. This is it. Blessed are those who are persecuted, persecuted uh, for following me. We're talking with Zev Parat, a rabbi from Tel Aviv, Israel, um, Messiah of Israel Ministries, and Carl Gallup, Hickory Hammock Baptist Church, and P.P. Simmons. Uh, dot com. We're talking about prophecy. We're talking about uh, the gospel to the Jew first. Jesus said to his disciples, when you go, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. First time he ever sent them out. He said to the woman, I didn't come for you. I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It was not to the exclusion of the Gentiles, but it was laser focused to bring the truth of the gospel and the fulfillment of 613 mitzvot commands of God that Jesus himself fulfilled in every regards, including the preparation of the sacrifice, including the entire fulfillment of the four days laid out in Exodus chapter 12. You might call it Palm Sunday. You might call it Easter. You may call it uh, the crucifixion. We call it Pesach. And he declared himself in this number of 153 fish as his third revelation to his disciples after his uh, resurrection was 153, Ha Pesach, in the Gematria, and revealing that he was that Passover lamb. If you have never seen it before, see it now in living color right here on Revealing the Truth. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the remaining half hour. The time has just flown by with Carl Gallops and Rabbi Zev Parat. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Igniting a Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, We've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www. .inbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live 
every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this special edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. Joining me live in the studio during the Carl Gallup special hour is Rabbi Zeb Parat from Tel Aviv, Israel, and Carl Gallup himself. Yeah. The man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> right here in the studio, Thank where you, you don't just see him superimposed. Shalom, Achi. Uh, <laughs> shalom, Achi. Uh, shalom, my friend. Uh, so, in this last segment, I want to take a look, a real quick picture, of the actors in the region uh, and the new alignments that are taking place. We see this election took place in Iraq, and the new elected head of Iraq was a f former active Shiite Muslim that has moved to a more moderate coalition agenda, kind of like Bibi Netanyahu was a hawk. Okay? So um, he had to align himself with others that were less radical in order to form a coalition government. The same setup is going on right now in Iraq, with Iran as their largest bordering nation, and you have now a Shiite, for the first time in many, 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 many years, uh, a Shiite Muslim elected to the prime minister role of uh, Iraq and forming a coalition government that is going to resemble a little bit what um, Erdogan is trying to do in Turkey. And when we look at the prophetic alignment to the Genesis 15 borders of Israel, and we see that that includes most of Iraq, up to Mosul and just short of Baghdad, uh, all part of uh, biblically mandated Israel. We see all of Jordan, northern Saudi Arabia, northern Egypt, uh, all of Syria, all of Lebanon. This is what God would call sovereign Israel. Uh, the actors in the region, which is Iran in Syria, Russia in Syria, China in uh, off the coast, uh, now you have a new dynamic in Iraq uh, that also is going to impact currency and oil uh, coming out of Mosul, which was one of the largest producing locations, ancient Nineveh. Uh, how is all this lining up in your mind prophetically? First, I want to get your input, and then I want to get your input, Carl. But Zev, how do you see it? Well, first of all, we're talking about the geographical uh, part of Israel. We live in a fallen world. Yes. And we're waiting for Yeshua to come back and take everything the enemy has stolen. Everything is lining up towards that right now. And I think that what you're seeing with China and the Middle East and, and uh, what's happening in the Turkish Empire and what you're talking about right now uh, is just another sign that we're in that period of time getting closer and closer uh, to the second coming. Uh, that's what I see. Having said that, uh, in Israel right now, you mentioned Iraq. 
they are uh, telling the Israelis to buy the Iraqi, uh, Iraqi currency. Yes. Because they're saying that that's going to be over the dollar. I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, that's what's uh, happening right now in the Israeli economy. They're buying the Iraqi dinar. Uh, dinar right now, and they're buying it at a massive rate. Yeah, the, the rumor has been for years that taking back to the days of Saddam Hussein, when the, do, when the dinar was three or four dollars to the dollar, that this was a great investment. But there are so many who have said that that's bogus, that this is a scam, uh, but people are buying into it. Someone uh, sent me some as a, as a gift. I put it in the safe, and, and uh, every now and then I'll say, you know, wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> it wouldn't be nice if that were to happen in my lifetime, something I can give yeah. to my, wouldn't it be nice? So I, I personally think that it's the enemy's tool of trying to penetrate into Israel and break the Israeli economy, actually. That's what I see. I see the enemy working that way, not just what we see. Counterfeit. Counterfeit. A, counter counterfeit. a, a counterfeit. So that's what I'm seeing in Israel right now. And you know, I definitely don't, uh, you know, I'm using that as an evangelistic tool as well to tell people not to buy the currency because I do see the satanic working in the behind the scenes on that, trying to destroy Israel in that aspect. You know, you know it's interesting that uh, money, and you and I both know the history of Israel, we don't put the faces of anyone on coinage or on paper money. Uh, you shall make for yourself no graven image. And as we see the pagan nations as they each edified and glorified, which is a wonderful gift to us from an archaeology standpoint because we can now set the time and dates of these digs and say by as soon as we find a coin, it's the, it's the greatest discovery within any structure is to find a coin because that's what dates the period in which this event or uh, the city was built and uh, establishes this timeline that happens to match the biblical timeline 100%, 100% of the time, which is quite extraordinary. We find discoveries of the kings and we find discoveries of Rome and other empires who have conquered. But what's so interesting is, is that no empire, none, who has ever stood against Israel exist today. None, not a single one. That includes the British Empire, which was the one to fall, then the Soviet Empire, the, the British Empire in 49, okay? India leaves them, Pakistan leaves them, all of a sudden, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Now the sun never rises on the British Empire. We watched the fall of the Soviet Union, the persecution of us and the pogroms, what they did, how they wanted to prevent. I remember as a child, uh, and even as a young man, banners across the street, save Soviet Jewry, J-E-W-R-Y. Save the Soviet same system, Jews. Yeah. Right, same, same with you in Israel as yes. the uh, Jewish National Fund, the, the United Jewish Appeal, all that. Uh, that my grandfather was so heavily involved in to bring Jews out of the Soviet Union to save the lives of our family. Uh, this is prophetic, the regathering back to Israel. Israel now represents 43% of the Jewish population of the world. This is extraordinary in 70 years for a people who are the people that are decimated. Uh, we are the only race of people in the world that from 1939 to present day our population today is less than it was in 1939. 1939, we were 18 million. Today, we're 14 million. A four million, do million person reduction, a two million dollar, uh, two million person uh, recovery, if you will, back from the decimation of Adolf Hitler. And so we're seeing these prophecies of the regathering. We're seeing this desert turned into a uh, an, an orchard that Israel is is agriculturally self-sufficient. The only nation in the world that's agriculturally self-sufficient. It's a foreshadow of Isaiah 35. Right, water self-sufficient, meaning you can cut off all supplies to Israel, and Israel would be self-sufficient because of the fact that we have always expected this to occur. They're off the grid. Off the grid, that's exactly right, that's exactly right. They don't need the grid of the world. So Pastor Carl, yeah. as you look at this same scenario that Jeb and I just looked at in the actors who are in this alignment, is it the, uh, we talked uh, about maybe Psalm, uh, the- uh, 83? Right, the Psalm 83, uh, 
actors were all involved in the Six Day War. They sure were. I went and saw a graphic that showed a circle yep. that encompassed all I, that. I, I think that's what Psalm 83 is about. I think. I'm not dogmatic, but it sure seems to be. I, I agree. I think Psalms 83 was already fulfilled. Yep. Although it is a foreshadow maybe of Ezekiel 38, but I do see that the nations in Ezekiel and the nations in Psalms are not the same. Yes. They're not. In fact, the ones in, in Psalms that, from what I see, are a lot of them are friends of Israel right now. Yes, yes. they so are. So it can't be that we're That's living right. in that time right now. Yeah. So it's very important to look at the biblical nations, look at the map, yeah. and see that will help us to see the time frames. Yes. And when you look at those biblical tribes in is, is, uh, Psalm 83 and the biblical nations, and you know where they are on the map, then you just go pull a secular map. Don't, don't, don't go on to some Christian website. Just go on Google Maps or Google Search or, or, and, and just images and, and ask for a map of the nations that attacked Israel in 1967. And it will show you the nations and the arrows coming in. It matches precisely with Psalm 83. I think we've already seen it fulfilled. I could be wrong, but right now that's kind of where I'm standing on this. The question then becomes is what will it take for Israel to meet the prerequisites of Ezekiel 38? And there's four distinct prerequisites. It says Israel has to be in the land. Now, we're in the land, but we're not in the land. Okay, We're in this one twelfth sliver of Genesis 15. And so in order for us to be in the land, in order for us to be at peace with our neighbors, in order for us to have no walls, no gates, and no bars, in order for us to have so much silver and gold that the world would want to plunder us, there's got to be an event that takes us to the biblically mandated borders, which includes what we talked about, Syria and Lebanon, uh, most of Iraq, all of Jordan, northern Saudi Arabia, northern Egypt. We have to have silver and gold, but I saw silver and gold when I was in Israel this last time. I saw so much of it that my mind couldn't perceive it, and that was black gold oil <laughs> and the silver pipelines <laughs> taking natural grass, gas from Leviathan to Cyprus. Silver pipes, stacks and stacks, and finally I began to see silver and gold because we don't have the natural resources of gold mines and silver mines within Israel. So how do we get so much silver and gold? <laughs> Is it like the days of the Egyptians who give it to us when we leave? No, we're going to be sovereign. And how are we at peace? And how We have walls now and we have fences and we have gates and we have bars and you can't go without checkpoint, 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 checkpoint. Uh, how do we get in that setup? What has to happen in order for us to extend, expand the pen, ten, pe ten pegs of Israel into that concept of in the land? Is it what we look like today? Or is it what it looked like when God confirmed his covenant with Abraham, the Genesis 15 borders of the rivers, the ocean, or the sea, and those borders, which include much more of the Middle East? I look at it more as a foreshadow of what will be, not so much of what's happening right now. I think that God is speaking about when he's coming back to regain everything that the enemy has stolen, when the borders will be the real Israel, I, that's what I see. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen right now before Ezekiel 38, after Ezekiel 38, but I do know that when I look at the Bible and I read it in Hebrew, I look at the prophetic side of it, of what's going to be for eternity, what's going to be when he comes back to take everything that this prince of this world has stolen. And you mentioned before coming back on a white horse as a victorious general. So I think that's when it's going to all play out. You know, Having said that, Israel is blessed right now, Eric, yes. and Israel is prospering. Oh, it's, it's incredible. And I like the black gold coming through the silver pipes. Yeah, I like yeah. that. <laughs> it's that, good. It's, 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 it's really quite an extraordinary picture to watch this, yeah. uh, the gas pipelines, the oil yeah. reserves. As you read the prophecies, and this takes us to a contextual perspective that the three of us share, and it goes to John the Revelator in the book of Revelation. And the visions given to them, to him, are idiomatic, idiomatically Jewish. The visions given to him are idiomatically Old Testament, yeah. Exodus, Daniel, yes. and the prophecies, and clearly Zechariah. states what was and is and is to come. This mm -hmm. was the, the angels, the seraphim around the Lord, instead of um, uh, Kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzavot, 
Uh, they're now saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory, which was the old song. They're now singing a new song that says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, the whole, uh, the, uh, who was and is and is to come. When we examine the prophecies okay, that were given to us by the prophets of old, as the Navi, as the messengers of God, as the ones speaking the very words of God, where God says, "Tell the write this down and tell the people this. That was our standard for the Navaim. This was the standard test that we had to apply. This is why the argument that Daniel wasn't a prophet was because he didn't, he didn't say, thus says the Lord. He was a, a seer or choser or, or, or someone who had visions, um, like a Joseph who was not a prophet. And John the Revelator is not a, he doesn't take a prophetic position. He, he's one who's describing a cinema, a beautiful picture of what was and is, and is to come. But wasn't that what all the prophecies were? To, take them, to tell them about, here's where you've been. Here's where you are. And if you don't change course, either now or sometime in the future, okay, this will be the fate. I, I see the picture of Jeremiah and the destruction of the scrolls the tearing up of the scrolls of Jeremiah when he says that this great city is going to be destroyed and my heart breaks for this and the king rejects him and says what you think this city is indestructible we are absolutely unconquerable we are the capital of the world we are so big we're too big to fall and all of a sudden God speaks and the Babylonian captivity takes place and so we we see this as always a foreshadowing but we also see it as a message for the time Yes. For a time and for a time and a half, according to the Word of God. You get this. The small percentage of the church is now awakening to the beginning. truth of all this. Just beginning. So. And we have, the three of us, the responsibility to ignite the church and ignite the nations for the true Word of God. Uh, in America, the slang word for potato is tater. Mm -hmm. Tater. All right? And so a common... No, that's only in Alabama. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> a, 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 common, a, a common potato yes. would be called a common tater. Yeah. Common, common tater. tater. All right? That'd be an ordinary <laughs> potato. Would just that's be called a, a rabbi, right? Yeah. That's called a rabbi. <laughs> so, so when we become more enamored with the potato than we do with the word of God, yeah. uh, this is part of the problem that uh, I'm, I'm seeing happen. Yeah. Uh, we've got about nine minutes left, and so I want uh, uh, I want you to tell the audience about Zev Parat Ministries, about Messiah of Israel, how to get you, how to book you, how to contact you, so that you Good. can come on your visits to the states or to Pakistan or to India or to Brazil or to Australia, where our audience is watching all over the globe right now. Uh, they're interested in what you have to yes. say. It's How all about the one new man. Anywhere that God sends us, in the world we go. No borders with the God of Abraham, Isaac, right. and Jacob. You guys have been in underground churches in China. We've been in China and underground churches. And uh, in Europe. In, in Europe, United States. Uh, United States. Uh, mentioned before the revival in China, the persecution in China. Uh, it's, it's rising over there, but the persecution is getting bad again. It was kind of calm for a few years, but because of the massive amount of revival, it's, they're trying to suppress it again, but, but they can't. They can yeah. take crosses off churches. They can close doors. They can put people in jail. They won't be able to stop the gospel. No. It's more difficult for them today because of Internet. Even though Google and, uh, and Facebook and everything is closed in China, they still find other ways to do it. They still, they still buy VPN services and get around the system and, 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 and get the information they need. And that's how we're watched. Uh, yeah. is, is we are VPN friendly and uh, scalable technology to yeah. get through. Doesn't look like it's a, a streaming telecast. Uh, it just looks like a file being downloaded. And so it's really not that big a deal. And we get, we get emails and likes from all over, hundreds of thousands. Amen. So you can find us at Messiah of Israel Ministries dot org dot com or dot net or zephort ministries dot com or just google my name we'd love from here to hear from you sign up to get our newsletter send in your prayer requests and uh, if you'd like me to invite me to speak there's a place over there uh, to register and you have to book in advance because of the schedules but uh, we'd love to go anywhere that God opens the door and because we're a family we're a mishpacha it's all about the one new man 
and share the truth. That's what it's all about. And you are a 501c3 here in the United States. Uh, so any contribution to the ministry and support of the work you're doing here in Israel, in China, throughout the world, to the four corners of the earth, uh, we're called to, it's the great commission, not the great omission. Mm -hmm. And we are to preach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We're to preach to the Muslims. We're to preach to the Chinese. We're to preach to the North Koreans. We cannot be stopped. The word of God must go forth to the four, four corners of the earth where he scattered our people and he's going to regather us back into Israel. So Amen. contributions to your ministry, uh, to uh, the information is on your website about how to donate, how to contribute to this great, great work. And we are a partner with Zeb Prop Ministries. We are a supporter and an encourager and, uh, as he said, Mishpacha family. Carl Gallops, uh, you've got so many things going on so much going on. You're here, you're there, you're everywhere. You're actually going to go on the other TV show uh, heading out of here today to yes. fly to uh, what I call the other yeah. the other TV and show. A couple of TV shows yeah. we're headed to. Yeah. As long as they're all going to the New Jerusalem, it's fine. Yeah. That's exactly right. As soon as we're this program's over, place. we're headed to the airport and we're off. There yeah. you go. Yeah. So, so uh, how can people reach you? Thank you. The, the quickest, easiest way is just to remember my name, Carl Gallops, that's G-A-L-L-U-P-S, carlgallops.com. And there you'll find a link to my church, link to thousands of videos, teaching, articles I'm in, all of my books. It's one single index page. There's live feeds, live articles, carlgallops.com. All right, Zev, what is your message that you want, to, if you could speak to our audience and tell them from your heart, what, what it is that's burning within you to get out, what would you say to them? Preparation to be the victorious bride of Jesus. And the only way to do that is to die in Messiah Yeshua daily, to repent, to turn to His Word, and His Word is sharper than two-edged sword. Through the biblical Hebrew foundation, through the true Yeshua HaMashiach, there's only one gospel. Paul says if there's anybody preach a different gospel to you, don't listen to him. We need to listen to the true gospel. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that we all become Ruth's. The Bible says that Ruth was a, was a Moabite, but it also says in the book of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 23, that Ruth worked the harvest. Mm -hmm. She stayed until the barley and wheat harvest. That shows that we're all to work the harvest together. The other woman, the uh, Moabite woman, was Orpah, and Orpah means to turn the back. And I believe we're living in that age right now where there's two sets of people. Some are Ruth's and some are Orpah's. I encourage you to be a Ruth Thank because you. Ruth That's also good. means to be a friend of Israel. That's good. Amen. That's good. Amen. Yeah. And you, Pastor Carl, a message to our audience before yes. we close out yes. this segment. How long do I have? You have uh, three minutes. Okay. Let me just say to the audience, and thank you for that. Thank you for this opportunity. First of all, we are living in the most prophetic time since the first coming of Jesus Christ. That's the time we're living in. I don't set dates. I don't know when the Lord is returning. I don't know when the rapture or the tribulation. I, I don't know. I have some thoughts. I'm passionate about some of my thoughts, but I'm not dogmatic. I am dogmatic about this. According to the Word of God and according to what's happening in the world, we're living in the most prophetic time since the first coming of Jesus Christ. So I encourage people everywhere. I call upon people everywhere. If you do not know Yeshua HaMashiach, if you do not know Jesus as Savior, Romans 10, 9, Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that Amen. God has raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. If you do know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, these are the times to be redeemed. You must get out and you must be a part of the harvest because we've been raised up for such a time as this. Thank you for watching today and God bless you. Thanks. In my summation, <clears throat> message to our audience. To our Jewish audience, you don't stop being Jewish. It doesn't matter what your rabbi might have told you. You can't stop being Jewish. That's it's right. in your DNA. It's good. You become a Jewish believer in Messiah. You do not reject the teachings of Scripture. In Matthew 5, 17, Yeshua said, I did not come to abolish the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill them. It doesn't mean to make them prettier, richer. It means to meet the requirements of 613 specific requirements and we can go through the scriptures and we can see where he was prepared, where he was sacrificed, how it was done according with God's word. We've given a prophetic word for the future.
I'm not talking about Gene Dixon that was 70% right on the Jack Parr show, on the Johnny Carson show, that mystic that uh, says have nothing to do with spiritists, have nothing to do with witchcraft, have nothing to do with people that talk to the dead. Talk to the living God. You pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You pray to the God of the living, Amen. not the God of the dead. And so I encourage you that while you have these time, this time, we don't know the number of days given to anyone, not to myself, not to Zev, not to Carl. We don't know. But teach us to number our days, and during those days, embrace ourselves, immerse ourselves, both in the biblical Hebrew, in the Greek, or in just a good, rich, deep a Bible study that tells you the truth of the inerrant Word of God. If you believe that all Scripture is god breathed then every word of it, from Genesis to Revelation, should be included in your study time. If it was just about the New Testament, it's, talk, it's like building a house starting with the third floor and moving your way up. You can't possibly understand what Jesus, Yeshua, fulfilled if you don't understand the foundation in That's which good. his life yeah. is built Amen. on. There was Amen. no New Testament Amen. at the time of Jesus. This is a chronicle of the Gospels of what was and where your help comes from. Your help comes from the Lord maker of heaven and earth. Your atonement comes through one place and one place only, and it's not to the Son. It's not praying to the Son. It's not praying to His mother. It's not praying to His friends. It's praying to the God, the Father, through the shed blood of Yeshua, Amen. and coming to the Father, for no one comes to the Father but through the Son. If you got anything from this, Jew and Gentile, one and Messiah, not Greek, not Jewish, not male, not female, a new creation, born again, made anew, like Rabbi Nicodemus was explained to, and you can have that too. Amen. Good. Stay tuned, and we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. We'll be right back.